We continue with our exploration of the size of the universe and looking at distances and luminosities of stars with the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, also known as HR diagrams. But let's summarize, first of all, what we know already. And if you haven't watched the previous videos, I do encourage you to go back and watch them. I will put links in as we go through this video. So first of all, we have trigonometric parallax. We can use this to find the distance to nearby stars, although that has its limits, and those limits are pretty close to the sun. The second thing we have is measuring the intensity of the light that's received from stars and using a known luminosity from standard candles to find the distance. The third thing that we have is using a combination of Wien's law and Stefan's law to find the luminosity and then using our intensity equation to find distance. And the HR diagram takes that a step further. The HR diagram was developed using stars of known luminosity and distance so that we can develop a pattern. And it's this pattern that we see here. We can then use this as a calibration curve. So if we know the temperature down here of the star and we can use Wien's law to find that temperature, and again, if you haven't seen that video, there's a link here, we can use Wien's law to find that temperature and then we can just go up to the main sequence and across to figure out the luminosity. So it very much makes life easier rather than having to calculate and rather than having to estimate the size of the star, the temperature will tell you what the luminosity is. Now it only works for main sequence stars because that's where we've got this line. What the HR diagram shows us is that most stars fall into this central category here, the main sequence. There is, however, a very large range along that main sequence from about 10 to the 5 solar luminosities to about 10 to the minus 4 solar luminosities. And so you can see that the luminosity is given in multiples of the sun's luminosity, and sometimes you see this written as L with a circle and a dot. You should also notice this is a logarithmic scale, and these are something that you have to be familiar with. In other words, it goes up in powers of 10. So what you'll see on a logarithmic scale is 1, 2, 3, 4, up along, up to 10, or possibly back to 1 again, and that just means 1 times 10 to the minus 4, 2 times 10 to the minus 4, etc. If we take the example of 10 to the 2, 1 times 10 to the 2 is obviously 100. 2 times 10 to the 2 would be 200, and so on, up to 10 to the 3, which would be halfway along here. 1 times 10 to the 3 is obviously 1,000, which is 10 times 10 to the 2. But 2 times 10 to the 3 is 2,000. So our scale gets contracted every time we move from one part to another. It allows us to plot things that have a very, very large range on a relatively small diagram and brings everything closer together. We'll come back to main sequence stars in a little and what those are, but you should know that stars belong at a position on the main sequence. So, for example, our sun would be somewhere in there. It doesn't move up or down along over the course of its lifetime. It's just got that luminosity and that temperature. Some things to note about the HR diagram. First of all, the top right here. Now, let's look at what the diagram is telling us about these stars. These are very cool. They're down here on the temperature scale. And remember that this temperature scale is reversed. So this is cool down this end, and this is hot up this end. It's also a logarithmic scale. So these are very cool stars. They do not have a high temperature, but they do have an enormous luminosity. And let's remember Stefan's law, which tells us that luminosity is proportional to the surface area of the star and to the fourth power of its temperature. So these temperatures are very low relatively, which means in order to have these enormous luminosities, these stars must be very, very large, and hence the name giant. The same but converse idea is for the dwarfs down here. You can see they have very high temperatures but very low luminosity. And remember, temperature is to the power of four, which means that even though they have those high temperatures, the total luminosity is very low, which means they must be very, very small, and hence the name dwarf. Now, the HR diagram connects in with the life cycle of a star, and you need to be able to track the life cycle through the HR diagram. So we're going to spend some time looking at life cycles. This very nice diagram summarizes it beautifully. To start off, we have a stellar nebula, and this is the birthplace of stars. And this undergoes gravitational collapse until the temperature within part of it, the part that's going to form the star, and the density is enough for fusion to start. 
Now remember that our hydrogen ions that are in there have to be moving fast enough to overcome electrostatic repulsion. That means that their kinetic energy has to overcome the electrical potential energy between them. And so kinetic energy of a gas particle we know is 3 over 2 kT. And electrical potential energy is given by q squared 4 pi eO times r. This has to be true in order for fusion to happen. And so you can find out that the distance between the hydrogen ions that's required by finding this r value. The density has to be high because we need to have a high enough collision rate within the star in order to sustain fusion. Now this is quite often asked about the conditions for nuclear fusion to occur. And those are the two, and those are the explanations. So when the stellar cloud collapses, what you get is gravitational potential energy being converted into kinetic energy. And of course we know in this expression up here that the average kinetic energy of the particle of the gas is proportional to its absolute temperature. So essentially as kinetic energy increases, the temperature increases. Now once fusion begins, that's when it joins the HR diagram and it lands on the main sequence. Where it lands obviously depends upon its temperature and its size, because that's what luminosity is proportional to. How long it spends on the main sequence also depends on those, because larger stars fuse hydrogen much faster than smaller stars, and so they spend a much shorter time of their life cycle on the main sequence. For example, our Sun, which is a relatively small star, will be 5 times 10 to the 9 years on the main sequence, and we're roughly halfway through that. What happens next with the life cycle depends upon the size of the star. This diagram sum summarizes it fairly nicely. If the star is less than about half the mass of the Sun, once it has gone through its main sequence, its hydrogen fuel has been used up, it just straight turns into a white dwarf. It just collapses, you get gravitational collapse, and it becomes a white dwarf. If it's between 0.4 and 8 times the solar mass of the Sun, it becomes a red giant, and then turns into a white dwarf after that. And I'll go into more detail about this in a moment. If it's greater than eight times the solar mass of the Sun, then we go to supergiant, supernova, and then we have more options at the end. But we're more focused on what happens with the main sequence. So we can see here, these are the ones between 0.4 and eight times the mass of the Sun. They're going to go to red giant and end up in white dwarf. And so if we look at our HR diagram, we can track what is going to happen to our Sun. It is going to turn into a red giant, and then it is going to become a white dwarf. And there have been questions where you've been asked to label with arrows where the Sun is on the main sequence, and obviously it's going to be where the luminosity is 1 in terms of the luminosity of the Sun, and then say what happens as its life cycle progresses up to giants and down to white dwarfs. The bigger stars here will start further up the main sequence, up higher because they'll have greater luminosity. Those become supergiants. At the end of their supergiant phase, they produce this spectacular show of light called a supernova. And then depending on the size of the core that's left behind after the supernova, they'll either become a neutron star or a black hole. Now these are not on the HR diagram, so we don't have to worry about connecting that part of the life cycle with the HR diagram. But let's look at the bigger stars. For a bigger star, up along here, it's just going to turn into a supergiant. The HR diagram does not show anything after that stage. We have one more tool. Again, based upon a lot of work that has been done in the past, as the HR diagram is, that allows us to, to use one more quantity that we can measure to look at the distances to objects in the universe. And this is a very, very powerful tool. This allows us to measure the distance to, to galaxies directly. That is Hubble's Law, and that will be the next video.